Hello, welcome back to the YouTube channel. I'm Angie, this is Tim. Morty's over here. And today we are recapping from Danielle Davis's new apartment. I feel she should have stayed here. Yeah? My opinion of the Davises took a nosedive after this episode. Mm hmm We'll get into it. So, no announcements this week. Seeking Sister Wife, Season 5, Episode 5. Seeking can be complicated. Wanna go down? More like seeking can be impossible, since we're barely at Episode 5 and this is the third time someone has been stood up this season. Yeah, it does seem to be impossible. We begin where we left off with the Maryfield storyline. The three adults are still arguing about Garrick's dishonesty concerning his dating app. Danielle accuses her creep husband of seeing new people. He denies that, saying that since he doesn't pay, he can't tell who's messaging him. It's obvious that he's being pedantic concerning this issue. Danielle and Natalia are upset that he didn't ununstall the app, but he's trying to double down by saying he isn't actively courting a third person, so it's okay to be on these sites and interact with anyone. I just think it's all stupid. He's already said that God gave him his sex dream with five <laughs> wives, so it's an inevitability either way, and I mean, he's being a total asshole, but we kind of already knew that about him. Because my thought was, the people that he's messaging are probably just trolls, because Think about it. Pretend that you're someone who watches this show and you know of the Merrifields and you know they're trying to find someone. You are curious to see if they're on this dating app that you have access to. And then you think to yourself, hmm, maybe I can play a catfish just to mess with him. Maybe I can just post a picture of a Google search for Brazilian hottie and maybe I can get a couple dozen thousand dollars out of this. Or just to waste his time because obviously this guy deserves to be mocked. Interestingly enough, I had a realization while watching Garrick in this most recent episode. I noticed that he has diminished facial expressions. And so I'm thinking to myself, isn't that a symptom for... It's a symptom for either Parkinson's... Autism or schizophrenia. I'm thinking he doesn't have Parkinson's. I don't know if he's autistic, but by the way that he's saying he keeps getting these visions of God telling him he needs five wives. <laughs> I mean, hallucinations. Um, or thinking the wind is something other than wind. I mean, I don't want to diagnose anybody, but I think that's the main reason people find him so off-putting is because he's only got one facial expression. Even when he cries, he looks like a latex mask where water does come out and he does turn red, but... Yeah, he doesn't change his face at all. So, I don't know. And the fact that he's always super wide-eyed. This man is definitely in his own world. Yes. Needless to say, this argument is putting a dent in the creep-eyed man's plans for a proposal. Again, it feels they just don't like him, and this is just... Who's they? Oh, the two women. I think Danielle has to stick with him. Natalia definitely is rethinking her decision to come here. She's realizing in real time that this is a train wreck. As Danielle narrates what chaos is ensuing, she tries to conceal a smile. She's like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. She's loving it. Garrick's reasoning for not outright deleting the app was because he needed to message back old people, which I'm assuming were potential partners they wanted to pursue but ultimately didn't. Just cut them off. You don't need to message these people. Danielle doesn't care, declaring that even by disabling the services, he is still able to message those very people back. He continues to play dumb, going, What? You can? Either he's <laughs> dumb or he's playing dumb. Either way... It's weaponized stupidity. Natalia whips out the translator app, concurring with Danielle's statement. She understands Garrick's vision for additional wives and reminds him that when they're ready to date someone new, he can just, quote, reset his account. I 
thought Natalia was being generous in this moment because she does say, "No problem, no problem." I am surprised Garrick was able to find two women who are able to be charitable in this moment, where they know he's gonna get more women, and what he's done is very shady,、It's、slimy. But they're saying it's fine. You can have the apps back again when you reset your account when we're ready to date a third woman. I don't know what any of these women expect. Natalia makes it clear what her issue is. Having the dating app on his phone isn't the topic; it's that Garrick broke his own promise. Garrick tries to mollify the law graduate, saying that he understands now. This continues to exasperate Danielle, who told the wannabe polygamist of the same frustration. She goes, "Now, now you understand." Garrick tries to defend his position. Apparently, he told his wife that he wouldn't delete anything until he felt there was some closure with certain people. He wanted to make sure things were quote settled with past people. This was all for the sake of not wanting to come off as rude. I'm concerned that he's more attentive to what some random strangers think of him as opposed to his own spouse. I'm thinking, dude, get your priorities straight. Yeah, people on the internet don't deserve your respect. In his confessional, he continues to lie, saying he quote quit talking to people, but that's not what women think. But you just said that you were talking to people. I think that he's trying to went on a technicality here. He's trying to say that he technically did the thing he said, but not really. And then he calls all women out everywhere on calling him out on his nonsense. On his nonsense. Yes. It's again. Does Garrick look good in anything? Is there ever a scene where you're like, oh man, Garrick? You know what? Maybe you're an okay guy. Because it just seems like he's going from weakness to weakness. Yeah, he's going from worse to worse, sir. Danielle disregards the excuse, saying women usually don't care about a response when that response is many months overdue. <laughs> I mean, nobody. That's not a gender thing. That's just a human thing.、Mm -hmm. They've usually moved on at that point, so Garrick has nothing to worry about. Natalia has had enough of Garrick's BSing. She tells him that she will be in her bedroom. The lying man then gives some nonsensical information. He remarks that this dispute is hurting his and Natalia's relationship. Funny how he doesn't mention his own marriage to Danielle. He's not married to that woman. I mean, they're legally divorced, but I think in their head they're still married because the divorce was just to get Roberto over here. Maybe that's what Danielle thinks. That she's still married. Yeah. <laughs> He then mentions that Natalia doesn't even know him that well, so she probably doesn't know where he's coming from. Oh, I don't know him very well at all, and I know exactly where he's coming from. I'm thinking, why are you proposing to someone that you yourself claim to not know very well? I mean, she's sort of exotic and Brazilian. How do you say no to that? That's all the criteria he needs. We pivot to a couple that we haven't seen for a couple of episodes. Nyla and Naim Salahuddin are driving in their car, ready to embark on a few tasks before meeting their potential sister wife, Keisha. Right now, they are on their way to a local flower shop. As they do so, they tell the car camera how nervous they are feeling. Naim is already thinking a few steps ahead, asking Nyla. What would she do if Keisha were to kiss him in a moment of elation from having been gifted these flowers? Nyla makes it clear that there is to be no intimate contact with this girlfriend until they get more serious. She implies that she would hit Naim on the head if he let Keisha kiss him on anywhere but his cheek. She says nobody can slob you down without permission, and in this scenario, I think slob means French kissing. It just means sloppy kissing, I think. Which, again, there's this weird, bizarre power dynamic. It's a situation where you can totally bang this woman, but I've got to be in control of it. Thing that is so weird. I don't know where they draw the line. I mean, I get it. There has to be some sort of boundary because in a world of where polygamy is not legal, 
you do have to make it clear when this person is your wife, and that is through how you treat her different from your actual wife and just a person you're dating. I just am not a fan of these weird power structures, specifically the one wife having more power over the other wives. Nobody looks good in this situation. Effed up power dynamics are the name of the show. They arrive to Carla's garden to pick up their order of flowers. Whilst the shop owner retrieves their order, Nyland makes it clear that Keisha and Naeem will not be spending the night together. She reminds him of what their dating rules are. Hand-holding, hugging, a kiss on the cheek, or a peck on the lips are fine. But absolutely, no sex or the acts leading up to it are permitted. In these polygamous shows, they love to talk about what you can and can't do while courting. It's funny because Cody broke all, all of those. Them. All of them. Because Naeem says that they set up a hotel room for Keisha to stay at because I guess they don't want her to actually be in their house while they're getting to know her in Pennsylvania because Keisha is from Atlanta. When Cody was dating Robin and we see him go to her house in Southern Utah, it was speculated that he stayed over in one of Robin's bedrooms. We don't know that. He might have done the same thing where he also booked a hotel room, but I don't know. Maybe Cody broke that rule. I mean, I always just assumed he did because I assume the worst with that man. <laughs> On the couch, the couple emphasize that they don't know Keisha that well, so there will be no overnight stays. Naeem recounts a time when a past potential sister-wife overstepped her bounds. She kissed Naeem behind Nyla's back. This broke trust between the two women, which resulted in the girlfriend withdrawing contact with Nyla and instead focusing all her attention on Naeem. Because of this breach in trust, Nyla wants to take things slow. I'm surprised that this betrayal didn't result in Nyla not wanting to pursue this lifestyle anymore, but it hasn't for some reason. I don't know what her motivations are not in any of this. Because her only motivation is to say that in Islam, that's one of the tenets, even though very, very few Muslims practice polygamy. Didn't she say that they weren't doing it for Islamic purposes? They were yeah. doing it for self-esteem purposes or for something? For personal reasons, again, to bolster Naeem's confidence. Besides, I can't think of anything that would lower a man's confidence more than having two women yell at him. Well, that's what Garrick's experiencing, but... I don't think anything could lower his confidence. In his own world. Carla, the shop owner, has arrived with their elegant potted flower arrangement. Oh, it said what her name was? I looked up the shop owner. Carla, I think Malanga is... And there was a picture of that woman on LinkedIn. <laughs> oh, okay, so an investigative journalism. We'll talk more about her later. Yes. Naeem remarks that Keisha will love the pink roses. This prompts the florist to suddenly ask, why is this event so special that they have hired a camera crew to film them buying these? They reply with the usual, we're polygamist. We're pursuing a potential sister wife. <laughs> and the florist lady looks like she just got punched in the chest. <laughs> She's just... Visibly oh. confused. Anyway. She goes, okay. The Salahuddin's then explain what a sister wife is. Carla seems to now regret associating her business with these weirdos. The producers pull her aside, eager to hear more of her reaction to these unique customers. They ask her what her viewpoint is on polygamist. She says, truthfully, they're assholes. They censor her answer, but you can tell that's what she said from how her lips moved. This woman has not been on camera for more than 10 seconds, and she is quickly becoming our second favorite character. The first, of course, being Jamila, or Jedzilla, as we'd like to call her. Yes, Godzilla and, and Jamila combined. Because Naeem described his mother as Godzilla. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. She won our hearts over. It's so great. The thing about these stupid polygamous shows is that they always ask the random cashier at the food court at the mall, what do you think about polygamists? And they always say something to the effect of, 
Oh, well, I thought that they're kind of weird, but these people seem to have gotten it right, or they seem like good people. I think we shouldn't judge them too harshly. Let's leave them alone, or something like that. But in this case, the Salahuddin's are not getting any slack cut from anyone. <laughs> No, everyone just looks at them and says, you guys are stupid, dumb, and we don't want you around here anymore because of your stupid polygamy bull****, <laughs> which I think is the most honest. And they're getting it from all directions. Love it. Mm -hmm. I wish that applied to more than just the Salahuddin's. That way people can get a dose of reality. So imagine a situation in which Cody asks the zookeeper, don't you think lions prove that polygamy is the natural way of things? And the zookeeper just looks at him and says, no. Are you crazy? You're disgusting human beings. And then they just played the reaction to that. And this is something that really upsets me about sister wives in general, is when it started, it was a TLC Learning. Learning thing. And they wanted to show the world what polygamy is. And so they really tried to make it look... Not oppressive. Not patriarchal. Not abusive towards children. But it is. And so it's just a huge fluff piece. From watching these more current polygamy shows, particularly Sister Wives, where... The theme is the complete opposite of what it purported to be. Yeah, people are getting a very different impression of what living this way is. And they're going to be honest about it now. Mm -hmm. Nyla and Naeem resume talking about their plans with Keisha. They want to set up her hotel room even further and then pick her up. As they head down to the airport, Naeem's phone starts blowing up. Keisha is sending a barrage of text explaining that womp womp, she will not be able to meet with them after all. I don't buy it. I think the entire trip has just been a plot device. I think they just went to the floral place to take up space. None of it's real. How many times has this happened in the show so far? I'm on the fence. It might be a real thing, but who knows? You're going to give them the benefit of the doubt. Yeah, because we've had two women this episode that tend to vacillate between seeing the person they claim to be so excited to meet and then the night before they go, never mind, forget it, I'm busy. This is the third one so far. Yeah, the first one was Desiree, the second one is Keisha, and the third one, as we'll see later, is Stephanie. Mm-hmm. Keisha is going to delay any plans to meet up today since she has to tie up some loose ends back in Georgia. These loose ends include finding a place to leave her car and moving all her belongings to a friend's guest house. My thoughts on Keisha is she's supposedly the same age as Nyla and Naeem, which I'm assuming is late 30s because Nyla and Naeem say they've been married for 16 years. So I'm assuming they got married in their early 20s. Okay. And we've seen their house. It seems they're pretty well off. Keisha might be not having a stable living situation. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking what are reasons people want to get into polygamy? Oh. They might want to pursue any man and put up with sharing him because they are desperate. Oh, they just don't want to pay rent. <laughs> Maybe. Because Naeem says this later where he thought, for some reason, even though they don't know her very well, he thought Keisha was a perfect fit for them. I don't know. We're just trying to figure out a way to justify why anybody would be looking at these two and jumping out of their chair saying, yeah, I want to get in between those two. Anyways, it goes without saying, Naeem and Nyla are pissed. Keisha was supposed to be on a plane, yet she decided to brief them on her laundry list of to-dos the day she was supposed to fly to Pennsylvania. This is another pattern we're going to see. When somebody is unable to do something, rage ensues. I mean, I get being upset because notifying someone that you're going to not meet with them 
and not giving any notification is very obnoxious, especially when you've bought flowers, you booked a hotel room, you made reservations at places, and all these plans. I'm sorry, I don't like those kinds of people that just put this on your lap at a moment's notice. I mean, yeah. Again, I still don't believe it's real. Mm. Nyla decides to call her. She suspects that Keisha has either blocked them or has gotten a new number since her call isn't even reaching voicemail. Okay. The plan moving forward is to see if Keisha will respond to Nyla's text. Nyla implores her husband to stay calm. He voices that he's trying to, reiterating how annoying it is to be bombarded with this information instead of being given prior notice. I still don't believe she was even real to begin with. In their talking head, Nyla and Naeem state how serious this relationship was. And they talk about sending her houses to get input on where they could live together. Naeem tries to look on the positive side of being stood up. They still made dinner reservations at a nice restaurant, and they're both dressed up for the occasion. They decide to go on their fancy date without Keisha. And thankfully, we didn't tag along because it has nothing to do with, oh no, we're going. The restaurant didn't look too fancy that it needed reservations. No. In fact, when they told the waitress that they didn't need three, I could feel as though she's thinking, no sh Sherlock, who cares? The uh, place is empty. You guys could add six and there would be no difference. They probably mean reservations to notify that there are going to be at least three more people that are going to be needing some space for their cameras and boom. Maybe. <laughs> Hopefully they got to eat food there. Some people who are experiencing their own personal record for being stood up are the Ryans. I love watching them get stood up. Justin and Becky are shown packing up some duffel bags and heading out on a weekend road trip. Becky confesses that Desiree bailing on them has taken the wind out of their sails. After that humiliating setback, their old girlfriend, Stephanie, called them just out of the blue. They explain her background again. They've been dating this woman for nine months. When they set their eyes on her, it was love at first sight. Things started getting serious pretty quickly until she ghosted them. The wiffle waffling woman then texted that it was okay for them to come see her. Not taking any chances for their one storyline to be pulled out from under them again, they immediately start packing their stuff to come see her for two days. This urgency to drive 24 hours round trip is due to Justin's intense love for her. He claims that he's never felt this magnitude of love outside his own wife and family, except for Stephanie. But in line with Stephanie's nature, she flip-flopped on them again. The night before they were to set off for her house, she texted them again saying she couldn't make time due to work obligations and they will have to delay their plans. The Ryans will not take this as rejection. They are going down to her house anyways. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess they already have the babysitters in place. They're probably thinking, we might as well do what we set out to do. Or they could have just had a nice weekend by themselves. The thing that's so irritating about these two is there's a talking head with Justin where Justin says, she's stood us up. Or maybe she just doesn't have enough time for work. Yeah, they like to complain Stephanie is flip-flopping. These two are equally as inconsistent because, as Tim says, they will say, she's the love of my life. I'll take a bullet for her. I've never loved anyone so intensely as much as I do Becky. I've been with Becky for 26 years. I intend to do the same with Stephanie. And then in the next confessional, they'll go, she lets us sit on the shelf. She takes us for granted. We put all this energy and time into her. Just look how ungrateful she is to us. Yeah, that was one of the funny things about their stupid road trip is they started it off really positive and full of energy. And by the time they get down to wherever it is the hell they're going, they are the most impatient, pissy, angry, two 
45 year old people you've ever met. It was so off putting. Here, I'll go into detail. Mm-hmm. The Ryans maintain that what they're doing isn't off putting. <laughs> In fact, showing up unannounced to Stephanie's house will probably melt her heart. Again, they want to show up there and, I guess, in a sense, manipulate her、mm-hmm. that it's okay for them to be there. It's very, very manipulative. You are putting somebody in such a hard spot. What are they supposed to say? Oh, go away? That's what they should say. That's what they did say. And now you're putting them in a position where. You don't want to have them drive 12 hours back home because you feel bad that they came all the way here for you. It's very controlling. Very manipulative, yeah. What is wrong with these two? This boundless confidence is making Becky and Justin giddy. The brunette woman explains that the prospect of seeing Stephanie is making her excited again. Justin asks if they brought chapstick. He rubs his mouth with his finger as he says this, declaring he wants to make sure his big lips are nice and moist for Stephanie. He said that. <laughs> no, I know he said that. I'm reliving the trauma. The married couple then start to giggle like a couple of schoolgirls. The reason why they continue to stalk, er, I mean, pursue Stephanie, is because even when she gets cold, she is their perfect one. She is their age. I'm assuming early 40s. She also had kids when she was young. Becky repeats a Robinism, saying she wants to be sister wives with Stephanie because she can definitely see them growing old with her and experiencing all those grandparent moments. I've said it once and I'll say it again. There's got to be a sex thing going on. Because <laughs> they're acting like horny teenagers just waiting for this Stephanie and. As they get going, it seems more and more as though the last scene of this episode would be body cam footage from a patrol、uh, car. For, yeah, from a couple of、uh, police officers having to arrest these two. Yeah, someone in a Facebook group said they wouldn't be surprised that after this season, Stephanie is locked up in their basement. If she's real. I mean, they had pictures taken with they her. They had pictures with someone and their face blurred. That could have just been whoever was at the place they were at.、Mm. It's convenient, don't you think? Stand in. Yes. <laughs> okay. Justin turns the car cam's attention to Becky's necklace, a gift from Stephanie to symbolize their sister wife relationship. <sighs> Which isn't a necklace also the thing that Danielle and Garrick did? Danielle gave Or- to Roberta. Okay. During this 12 hour car drive, they decide to call Stephanie for the 20th time. I don't know how many times they call her, they just say a lot. <laughs> no surprise, it goes to voicemail. Becky is not perturbed by this saying, as usual. She tries to explain Stephanie's bitchiness. Apparently, their girlfriend has a friend that threatened to not be Stephanie's friend anymore if she became a polygamist. And I posited that this friend was Stephanie herself. Why Stephanie has multiple personalities? Either that or she just couldn't be her own friend, knowing that her friend did something so stupid. <laughs> That's convenient. Well, I have a friend who just could not respect or love me if I went with you two, and her name is me. <laughs> But the Ryans are not put off by the elusive woman, saying she has recommitted permanently to them several times. Recommitting again and again and again means that it wasn't permanent at all. No, that's the definition of impermanent. This would just be so off putting to me if I were the Ryans. The Ryans are, they're not so great people. No. Stephanie is a not so great person. I mean, if what they say is true. We've yet to confirm whether Stephanie exists, let alone what they're saying about her is true. Becky admits that the constant back and forth trips is taking a toll on her. Justin agrees, saying this might be their last sucker trip or sucker move. I doubt it. Speaking of suckers, we are back in Cancun, Mexico. Garrick sits Danielle down to give a half apology to her. He is afraid that due to his actions, Natalia is questioning his character. Garrick asserts he needs to start making Daniela and Natalia more of a priority. It hurts to do this because he doesn't want to displease God 
who for some reason really wants him to have five wives. And that for some reason, making his wives happy is also against the will of God. The guy makes no sense. Danielle, who I do not feel sorry for anymore, says that after all of Garrick's shenanigans, she really does believe he is a sensitive, emotional, and kind person. Well, I can believe the first two, but I don't know about the last one. Sensitive and emotional? That doesn't mean that those are good. He could be very, very temperamental, and he can also be really pissed all the time. That's still being sensitive and emotional. Emotional. He's sensitive and emotional when he doesn't get his way. And not in a good way. He really didn't have any intent to hurt Danielle or Natalia. I mean, who really intends to hurt people with their stupidity? Yeah, that's the point of trying to get away with something. You hope they don't get hurt because you think they won't even find out. Mm -hmm. After this apology, Danielle voices that she is still uneasy about a proposal since they've only known Natalia for four months. Garrick, who just said that he'd consider his wife's feelings five seconds ago, says he won't do that since a proposal would prove to Natalia that he isn't shady. Sure, man. The gullible woman gives in to his demand, professing, God leads us and we walk together. They kiss and make up just in time for Natalia to catch up with them. Garrick relays to the Brazilian woman through Google Translator that he has worked things out with sister and will try to do things right moving forward. God, it's so gross when he says... Sister? Yeah, it makes me feel like... He's a parent referring to his own children as... His own wives as children. Children, yes. Calling your daughter or anyone in your family sister feels similar to a cartoon for children. Yeah, it's infantilizing your wife. Garrick is all kinds of... Cringe. Yeah. Natalia takes his apology with a grain of salt. She hands the phone over to Danielle so she could hear her thoughts. They aren't good. Danielle basically gives her husband the benefit of the doubt, still touting that he is a moral man and only wants what's best for the both of them. Garrick promises that he'll delete all the dating apps from his phone. This alarms Natalia. She asks him in English, Apps? How many of these do you have? The weasel stutters. He asks for the phone again to relay an exact number. She dismisses the device, implying that she understands numbers in English. He goes, Lots. Uh, ten. That obviously alarms Natalia. But during this scene, Tim said, I can't even name five dating apps. And Garrick has 10 installed on his phone. Mm -hmm. He's casting a wide net, all of them. He's probably got the whole kit and caboodle. Well, Garrick says the reason he has this many apps is because it's hard to find someone on a regular dating platform who wants this lifestyle. And the second hurdle is even harder, which is... We need someone who wants to specifically be with me, <laughs> Garrick. Imagine that you're on a dating website and you get messaged, hey, we got matched. Oh, that's super great. Yeah, I got a wife. Is that cool with you? No, why would that be cool with me? Okay, bye. There must not be a lot of polygamy centered apps because I guess he's being specific. He wants the woman to believe in the Bible or his version of the Bible. Mm -hmm. He wants them, obviously, to be polygamous. He probably wants them to be not fluent in English. <laughs> okay, he's already got a Brazilian, but he wants a French woman as well. Uh-huh. He's going for the Captain Planet, the Planeteers. He wants <laughs> each major race. Uh, I don't know. This guy, 10. That's insane. He's insane. We head on back to Nyla and Naeem. The two are headed to the Cinder Inn Bar and Grill, the restaurant they were going to bring Keisha to. They discuss the aftermath of what I assume is their falling out with Keisha. Naeem throws in the towel in terms of getting to know people through social media. He'd rather get someone more local. That way, they can at least interact every week. Nyla is hesitant. The point of the internet was to reduce the dating world into a group who already have the characteristics they were looking for. 
for starters, someone who wants to be a polygamist. Naim disagrees with that statement. From experience, he tells her that people still lie about what they are looking for. He goes, they may claim to want this lifestyle, but once they test it out, they become more demanding. What is he expecting the opposite to be? People claim they don't want to be polygamists, but then they change their minds and want it after meeting them? I don't know why he wants to meet people face to face, because I get it, there are many catfishers out there, people who spruce up their profile and elevate who they are, but if you say that you're a polygamist on a polygamist dating platform... That's your best bet. Yeah, that's at least the first hurdle is gone, which is the tallest one so far. Yeah, it seems to me that he's upset that it didn't work, and so now he's saying, oh, well, this'll work, even though he has no reason to believe it will. And he wants someone to be in their city? Uh, Good luck. His wife agrees, but is hesitant to meet someone the traditional way. It's hard for her to sustain enthusiasm that a friendship with a sister wife will blossom. It's happened multiple times for it only to end in the woman rejecting her. She is reluctant to open herself up to that degree again. Join a book club. Yes. And Naeem, get therapy. Naeem empathizes with her. Seeing Nyla so despondent is making him less motivated to date again. Nyla, who of course wanted her husband to live this way, brushes off these deterrents, saying they can't let a few bad apples taint this experience for them. I think these two just need to be like Garrick, as you said, cast a wide net, i.e. download 10 polygamous dating apps. No, I think they were just normal dating apps. Because you're bound to find a couple crazy women that will stick this through. Another issue would be that if there is a polygamy dating website, it's just going to be filled with a bunch of Mormon fundamentalists, which is not what these two are looking for. Would it be different if they were looking for Muslim fundamentalists? Maybe, but if you go to the Midwest, anywhere from Colorado up to Wyoming, you can't throw a stick without hitting an enclave of weirdo polygamists. And they're all Mormons. You can't say the same thing about Islamic people. In the yeah, because I don't think there is prevalent here. I'm just talking demographic. Well, a group that is unconcerned with religion entirely are the Davises. We see some tiny gophers squeaking at one another. I thought that was funny. The depiction of the local fauna. Mm-hmm. This entire scene is a one-on-one discussion between April and Danielle. Mm. The self-proclaimed matriarch of the family wants to discuss at length how Danielle messed things up for them. Major ick. So I don't like this title of matriarch because when the Davises were introducing himself, Nick was very clear he wanted all of his wives to be equal to one another. A way he wanted to do that was for none of them to be married to him. I like that aspect. He wants there to be at least no hierarchy, I should say. Mm -hmm. But the fact that one of the sister wives is saying that she's the matriarch, either because she's a lot older than the other sister wives or whatever, does put her on a pedestal. It's unpleasant. And I did not like this interaction. It felt so gross. Yes. Before this serious conversation, Danielle is looking pretty at ease. She's smiling as she's doing some chores. And April makes sure to wipe that smile off her face real quick. She makes clear that Danielle's leaving left an impact on the family. The first wife expresses her disappointment in how Danielle was able to secure her own apartment with, gasp, her own finances, without consulting anyone. When I first heard that, I thought that was a loaded accusation or observation, if you want to be nice, where why did you have to emphasize the fact that she handled her finances? It makes it seem as if you're entitled to her money. Yeah. Or that she wasted her money on this apartment that she's not living in because that could have went to their combined family pot. That was a red flag for me. I think part of it also is it's evidence that she had been planning this for a very long time. 
and she thinks that Danielle is conniving. I guess, but that still doesn't justify the way that April treats her. Danielle tells her that the reason she didn't notify anyone with her plans was because she thought it would be less hurtful. April says that her leaving set a precedent that anyone can just up and leave whenever they want. Which are all consenting adults. Yeah, that was technically always a possibility because what the other option is, all of you just feel trapped in this arrangement for eternity. It's like the one scene from. Rick and Morty, when Jerry leaves the Jerry play place, and he leaves, and she says, "Oh, that was always allowed." <laughs> hey, Dan, that was always allowed. But it's like the opposite. April makes a disappointed face to the twenty-four-year-old.、Mm-hmm. She successfully guilts Danielle, reminding her that Nick, Jennifer, even Vera, have also felt the heaviness from her sudden departure. She brings up a task. That was typically done by Danielle, the brushing of the infant's teeth, to remind her that her role in the family is imperative, and she should think twice before leaving them again. I don't understand the purpose of this conversation. Because April could have made the topic of the conversation more about how she was sad that Danielle left, and now that she's back, they are so happy that she's back. She came back. This is a good thing. You should be praising her. If this was a functional relationship, you'd be telling them how much they missed her, like a prodigal son thing, where、mm-hmm. they just rejoice that you're even here at all. When Danielle first left, April said that when she's back, we'll forgive her. We'll just go on with our daily lives. But she just wants to hammer down on this, saying, "You hurt us. I need a promise that you won't do this again." Yeah, she rakes Danielle over the coals. She makes. Danielle weep for I guess shame, and I don't understand the purpose of it. Because Danielle is already even before this conversation happened, you can tell she's been mentally berating herself because she starts to cry. She says, "I know I feel so bad because I never would want my children to think I abandoned them or I don't love them anymore." She keeps emphasizing that she does love all the people in this family very, very much,、mm-hmm. but. April tries to put some sauce on the conversation because now she has Danielle right where she wants her. She says a lot of things about forgiving herself because we forgive you, and it doesn't feel like that. And Danielle starts crying and sobbing that she'll never do it again, never do it again. Yeah, she's saying truly lesson learned. I'll never do this again. And it's unnecessary. It's. Toxic. It's abusive. It's manipulative. The way that April is trying to threaten and scare this poor woman, and she was already feeling alone and isolated already. And if she was feeling like she wasn't secure, that she had to leave, the one who's partially responsible for feeling that way are you, April, April. Jennifer, and Nick. Yeah, it、um. feels really, really gross. It feels the most culty so far. Best case scenario, April's doing this because she's extremely insecure and she's doing this to try to make herself feel safer. But there are so many worse ways, and that's not even a really great look to begin with. Even if up until now we thought that Nick was weird, but okay, but this April lady, no, not okay. This is not okay. I would say even the same thing about Jennifer because in what like two episodes or the previous episode when they were having the barbecue, Jennifer didn't even look at Danielle once when she was explaining what they're going to be doing in the backyard. She's like, okay, we're going to film. This is how it'll go. I think April and Jennifer are like this. They're the ones that are in charge of everything.、Mm, maybe April says some platitudes about this, that, or the other thing, or maybe we should do this. And but the damage is done at that point. This was very akin to a mother censuring her child. How old is April? I would say early forties or late thirties. She's almost. Maybe old enough to be Danielle's mom. Yes.、Uh, this scene was just so toxic. April does claim that Danielle is more important to her than expanding the family, 
And then she immediately goes to, but we're still going to expand the family. We'll just take things slower. The bit that got me was when she was just harping on this woman and then says, I forgive you. Do you? Do you really? That seems like weaponized forgiveness. Where she says, next time you're thinking about leaving or next time you feel apprehensive, you come talk to me about it. Which, again, I think Danielle should have just stayed in the apartment because I didn't realize how bad the dynamics of the Davises were. I was in the middle of making an animation where Nick is talking to Danielle, asking her to stay in the family. And then Danielle Merrifield, Natalia, Natalia and Shane come in and say, can we join to... Can we be your sister wives? And Nick's like, there's room for you. We'll make it happen or something like that. I don't think I'm going to finish it because after watching the Davises, they wouldn't be safe there either if this is how the matriarch decides to run things. The Davises definitely took a heel turn this episode. I think it's telling the kind of way that we, in these situations, always assume that it's the man who's the abusive one. But in this situation, women can be just as destructive to the members in their family. I don't think polygamy works, people. Yeah, if you haven't figured that out by now, you haven't been watching. We are back with the Merrifields. Garrett quantifies the amount of apps he has installed on his phone. A whopping 10. He explains that the reason for being on this many platforms is because he wants to increase the odds of finding someone who wants this lifestyle. Natalia asks if he is hiding anything else from her. Garrett claims nothing comes to mind. She throws a hypothetical back at him, saying he would be just as pissy with her if she were on 10 dating apps, of which she wouldn't delete due to still having to message randos that are reaching out to her. He starts to then speak in a zombie-like trance. I absolutely hate myself for lying and doing anything like that, and I am... Very ashamed. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Not moving his face in any emotive way. He always looks like he's confused. Before it is even translated to Portuguese, Natalia gives him a disbelieving look. And for good reason. In his confessional, Garrick says that the apps are gone. For now. But they'll be back since God promised him five wives. So Natalia will just have to work through that also. Oh, Those women will get their way for now. But when the time comes, they're going to see I'm the one on top. I don't see the point of this scene. There was no apology at all. Danielle feels sorry for her drowning husband. She tries to paint him in a positive light, affirming that it was not Garrick's intention to hurt Natalia. The law graduate rolls her eyes and scoffs. She tells Danielle that she defends Garrick too much, and that is why he never bears the consequences of his actions. Thank you, Natalia. A big reason Garrick is like this is because Danielle allows it. She lets herself be a doormat and be disrespected left and right. She should have left the second that he said that he had a vision. Mm -hmm. I'm struggling to understand why Danielle is even still here. She says that she isn't as close with Natalia as Roberta was with her. But I'm thinking to myself, Natalia has had Danielle's back more so than the other one, because I'm just thinking of the time Robert and Garrick had a quickie behind Danielle's back when they were in Cabo. But at least Natalia is saying, I'm going to stand up for you in a way that you desperately need because Garrick walks all over you. Natalia is pointing things at what's wrong with Garrick as a person. And Danielle just keeps saying, he's really not like that. He really does mean well. And Natalia says he never takes responsibility for his actions. As far as Natalia is concerned, Garrick has only been disrespectful for Danielle. And that's the only thing Natalia has seen. And she's being vocal about it. Danielle goes, oh, now, now you understand? I don't know why he acts like this, because I've been telling him this and this for months. As soon as Natalia points this out, Danielle is very quick to be on his side again. It was just weird. Why are you doing this? If the women are on the same side, 
it will be two against one with Garrick, but because you keep saying, in the end, I've known him for 20 years or whatever, he's not as he is in this instant. I feel Danielle might be more jealous of Natalia than she is mad at Garrick, even though Garrick is the one who's actually doing the bad things. What do you mean she's jealous of Natalia? She said, you did it for Natalia, but you didn't do it for me. She says that she doesn't warm up to oh. Natalia as much, and I don't know. I'm trying to figure out some situation where it makes sense to be giving Garrick any sort of grace. Eh, these people are just the worst. Natalia says she feels she hopes giving Garrick a vote of confidence for now isn't going to bite her in the <laughs> The wide-eyed man ends the discourse by quoting the Bible. Like always, Garrick equates himself to a king, particularly King David. He explains what his sap is and that God is basically refining him to be a better man for them. He's wrong about what his sap is. It's just a medicinal herb. It doesn't fester or something. Also, way to compare yourself to a guy who was a one of the most famous adulterers in the history of the Western world. Oh, yeah. then that's accurate then. Yeah. <laughs> Natalia rolls her eyes again. I'm thinking, does Natalia really like these two? I feel like she's just doing this to get a free vacation out of them. I don't know what Natalia's... M.O.? I don't know what her motivation is because... She doesn't seem to like this guy at all. Well, she says that she likes him, and that's the only reason why she's giving him a second chance. Or maybe this is like Married at First Sight, where she hopes that after she breaks up with her supposed partner on TV, she'll just get someone better down the line. Maybe. I don't know. The last segment is given to the Ryan family. Justin states that if Stephanie rejects them once more, they will definitely move on from her. They've already booked this trip, despite her canceling their date, so they might as well make the 12-hour drive down to her house. You know, out of spite. <laughs> when we were watching this, I was thinking, why are they doing this? And you said they're being paid to film this mess because they don't have real jobs. Yeah. <laughs> They'll keep chasing her since Justin loves her to death so much he'd definitely take a bullet for her. You'd take a bullet for her. But you wouldn't leave her alone if she asked you to. Hmm. I think that's more about what you want and less about what she wants. These stalker-like sentiments continue to escalate. Justin says Stephanie is making this cat and mouse game more difficult on them. He'd rather she be direct and give them that initial smack in the face of, we're not with each other. And thinking, but you're the one who's playing this game. These two are so creepy. Their delight in Stephanie suddenly takes a turn. After this long drive, Becky goes from being elated at seeing her again to we're breaking this cycle with her. We're tired of being treated like crap. She can literally throw us away and put us on the back burner. I guess this trip is really taking a toll on them. I mean, 12 hours in a car will do that to you? We get to the part in the episode where the Ryans are full on slamming this woman they claim to admire. Becky is tired of this person not appreciating all of the energy, time, effort, emotional support, and everything that they gave to her. And again, why are you still pursuing this lady? If she's that much of a problem, just leave her alone. It sounds like they just want to punish her. Mm. Justin concurs with this imputation. For nine months, they have given 110% of their effort. They describe her as a player who's playing with them and they don't know if she even loves them. Now they're trying to... Force themselves to be in her life? I mean, yes, but at this point, they're trying to claim her motivations. They don't know that, but they're insinuating that her actions clearly mean that she's this way or another thing, and it's pathetic. They know this stuff is going to be let out on national television, it's not okay to say we want you to be our sister wife and then denigrate them in front of millions of viewers because they do go on to say that we're going to go pay her gym membership. Maybe that'll soften her stance toward us. And I'm thinking to myself, what else are you paying for? Her Costco membership? Her Netflix account? I thought you said this woman was the same age as you guys. 
It feels really gross. They're acting like her sugar parents. Justin elucidates on what they mean by giving so much to her. He says that they're always buying her stuff because they love her so much. They even go to her gym and renew their membership for her. You know, like a stalker. Yeah, I was gonna say it feels more stalkery and less sugar parents. They have ownership of her because we bought this thing for you. Now we own you. Kind of thing. Some people do that. They'll buy expensive things for people, demanding a reciprocation type thing, and that's what I feel from them. It's the same way that they're going to go so far out of their way to show up, and Stephanie is going to be put in a position where she can't say no without feeling bad. We bought you this stuff. Now you got to be in our three-way forever because we paid your gym membership one time, and it's manipulative and it's bull. It's toxic, no matter what it is. After going to her gym, because remember, Justin likes a woman who works out. <laughs> yes, I I thought that too. But we got to make sure that she's hot when I get there. They decide to go confront her. They think they'll know she's at her house if her car is parked in her garage. And for a second, they think, what if the garage is closed? And then Becky says, "The garage has windows. I'll just see through them." I'm not afraid. And then they say, "We're in love with Becky. She's our ride or die." And Justin says, "I'm also in love with Stephanie. I will stalk them. I will jump over their fence." I was thinking to myself, "What's a good road trip without a little bit of breaking and entering?" I mean, yeah, it's not a good road trip unless it ends with a restraining order. <laughs> Which will be promptly ignored. You know, the restraining order really is just what is it? It's a playful banter, really. The episode ends with Becky ringing the doorbell, and we are left on a cliffhanger. I was fully expecting sirens, the red and blue lights, <laughs> and Becky punching a cop, but we didn't get that. Hopefully, that'll happen in the next episode. All right, so that's the end of the recap. Garrick possibly has a neurological disorder, which prevents him from making faces, and he's the worst. Also, ten apps. That's excessive. That's excessive, man. With the Salahuddins, we are introduced to a new delightful character, Carla the Florist, who informs us that all polygamists are a holes. We get a side story about Keisha supposedly ditching them, and with the Davises, April Davis gives us a good look of just how destructive she can be to Danielle's mental health. The Ryans show us what two forty-five-year-old married couple gets up to after they've stewed about getting stood up by someone for twelve hours and decide that it's okay to commit some crimes. <laughs> So thanks for making it to the end, and we will see you next week. Bye.